Hey everyone, and welcome to our DAT IQ weekly market update. This is our update for April 27th, 2021, the last show in April, if you can believe it. I'm Ken Adamo, Chief of Analytics here at DAT, and we have a full house this week, as well as a special guest. Uh, as always, we have Ned Damon, Principal Data Scientist, um, Dean Croak, Principal Industry Analyst, and yes, for everyone who pointed it out, I believe we corrected titles, so principal should be spelled the same. Thank you for pointing that out. And we also have um linkedin luminary of freight statistics and analysis dr jason miller joining our show this week welcome everyone hey. Woo. good morning but, uh thanks for joining us jason really appreciate you taking time out of your morning to uh to indulge us and our listeners this morning uh thanks for having me on so Jason's going to be talking about some of the really cool stuff he's working on with Michigan uh, at Michigan State with some of his colleagues. But I would also encourage you to drop any questions you might have for us or Jason. Start thinking about them early. I'm anticipating a lot of questions this week, um, and we will do our best to get to them uh, at the end of the program. So for those not familiar, we're here every Tuesday at 10 a.m. Eastern, 7 a.m. Pacific, talking about trends in the freight market, what we're seeing, most importantly, what we think can help you make better business decisions um, in your day to day. So with that, I'm going to move to our key points of the week and uh, run through those before I then turn it over to Dean. So let's move on to those key points of the week. Uh, so flatbed is really the story this week from a rate and market conditions perspective. If anything, they can, they're accelerating more upwards and, and deviating from where they were from a trend perspective in 2018, up 40 cents a mile just from February um, and up 28 cents a mile from same time in 2018. Um, Pretty much a plateauing effect for dry van and reefer, which Dean will cover in more detail in a few. Uh, truckload tonnage index from uh, ATA down 5.1%. And then the Michigan State retail truck tonnage index up 20%. Surprising no one. I love that comment. Uh, so with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dean to walk us through our market update in more detail. Dean? Ken. Uh, so let's start with the load load board activity, the load to truck ratio for dry van. Uh, dry van spot market volumes decreased for the second week in a row, a little bit of a cooling. They dropped 7% last week. Uh, definite sign that the market is sort of settling down after some of the impact caused by February's polar vortex. Uh, the load to truck ratio moved down ever so slightly last week from 4.87 to 4.42. Over to the refrigerated load to truck ratio, a uh, very similar trend to dry van, uh, exhibited some seasonality. There was a 6% drop in load posts last week. Uh, truck posts increased last week, so a possible sign capacity was uh, easing. So the load to truck ratio moved down to 9.02. Uh, still a, a long way above last year and, and 18 now, our next best year to compare tight capacity market to. And as Ken said, flatbed really is a fascinating story in terms of how it's mirroring the 2018 market load post volumes last week were 21% 20, higher than the same time in 2018. Um, spot market load posts have doubled since the start of this year. So just to give you an indication of how tight capacity is in that market, the load to truck ratio is at 93.58 this week, almost identical to 2018. So having a look at our market condition index, we'll start with the MCI for dry van. Um, average rates in the top 10 markets dropped three cents a mile last week. Load posts were down 8%. Uh, average rate in the top 10 markets was about 247 a mile, slightly higher than the all market average. Atlanta is always uh, very high in the, on the top 10 list. It was the number one market last week. Volumes dropped 9% last week, but capacity was tight, only moved up by one cent a mile to an average of 239. Uh, having a look at the West Coast markets, uh, reversal from the recent weeks, capacity eased last week in Ontario and Los Angeles. Uh, rates were down one cent per mile to 301 in Ontario and down to 290 a mile in Los Angeles. Uh, we talked to some of the experts over there at the Marine Exchange. Uh, congestion is easing uh, off the San Pedro port complex. Uh, at, at the moment, there are 20 vessels at anchor versus zero this time last year. So there's still congestion, but it's a long way down from the 40 vessels that were at anchor in February. What's really interesting is uh, Kip Loud had sort of des des described the congestion as spiky. And, uh, and to give you an idea of what that means in terms of truckload impact, um, there are 17 vessels due in the next three days, um, six today, three tomorrow, and then 12 on Thursday. So there's sort of inconsistent spiky volumes are what's translating into some of the load board activity we see, such as high volume e-commerce lanes like Los Angeles to Phoenix. Um, rates continue to climb now at $4 a mile on that lane. 
Uh, that's up $1.85 compared to the same time last year. Um, the other market we wanted to have a look at this week is a backhaul market, Denver to Chicago. Just to give you an idea how tight capacity is overall, uh, Denver to Chicago is a really deep backhaul market. Uh, but rates were up last week, um, but only up to a dollar and eight per mile. But it's 29 cents a mile higher than this time last year. Moving over to the refrigerated market condin condition index, it's all produce this week. Produce markets dominate the top 10. Uh, eight of the top 10 are very strong produce markets. Volumes were up in the top 10 by 30% week over week. Rates are up three cents a mile to $2.69 on average, excluding fuel. For context, that's eight cents a mile higher than the average for all 135 markets. Uh, the focus this week is in Miami, uh, where we're in the final throes of produce season down there, April, May, bring about the end of the season. Uh, a lot of tomatoes and watermelons, about 38 to 40 percent of the volume coming out of there this week is tomatoes. Uh, we'll see a lot more watermelons come out in May. Rates are up in Miami, 9% uh, week over week increase in volume. Rates jumped to 246 a mile. Uh, it's also peak shipping week for uh, or peak shipping season for Mother's Day flowers, which is May 9. So a lot of the focus is on Miami, where about 90% of all flowers arrive from Ecuador and Colombia. Um, about uh, 70 truckloads a day uh, will move out of Miami. Most of it's team freight, a lot of hand unload. Drivers don't really like it a lot, but there's a lot of good volume coming out of there. So expect some very tight capacity for the next few weeks. Uh, further north in Lakeland, it's a big produce market to the west of uh, Orlando. Volumes are up 24% week over week. Rates are up seven cents a mile to 216. And all of the produce markets on the west coast, Los Angeles, Ontario, Fresno, San Francisco, and the Salinas Valley, rates are all up about seven cents a mile last week. Uh, wrapping up the market condition index with a look at the flatbed market and seasonably tight capacity, uh, but in the top 10 markets, which represent about 25% of our load posts each week, volumes dropped about 2% last week in the top 10, rates dropped about 8 cents a mile, but to an average of 327 to all destinations. For context, that's 69 cents a mile higher than the all market average for all 135 markets. So capacity is very tight in big markets like Little Rock, rates jumped 23 cents a mile last week to 344. Um, and the other big lane is, of course, Houston's one of the big flatbed markets um, all year round. And after being flat for the last 12 months at around $2.10 per mile, spot rates on the 1500 mile haul from Houston to Los Angeles jumped last week to 272 even as high as 324 for top paying loads on the return trip, which a lot of carriers favour. Uh, from Los Angeles to Houston, rates were up $1.90 to $1.97 last week, making a round trip a very profitable, 234 a mile, excluding fuel. Uh, wrapping up with our year over year look at spot rates, dry van rates uh, definitely found some resistance level to moving much higher uh, from the 237 they were at the start of March. They've been decreasing for the third week in a row, albeit slightly. Uh, rates were down two cents a mile last week to 231, uh, up 95 cents a mile compared to this time last year. And um, the other benchmark year I like to look at is 2018. Rates are 48 cents a mile higher than the same time back in that tight capacity period uh, in 18. Having a look at the year-over-year -year review of uh, reefer rates, spot rates cooled slightly last week, dropping by one cent a mile to 261, excluding fuel. Uh, they're up 90 cent, 97 cents a mile compared to this time last year and up a whopping 52 cents a mile compared to this time in 18. And lastly, having a look at the flatbed spot chart, as you can see, the red line much higher than the blue line, which was 18. Uh, rates were up three cents a mile last week, continued climbing to 258 per mile, excluding fuel. Now 28 cents a mile higher than 2018, and they've increased 39 cents a mile since the start of 2021. An amazing story. So that's it for this week's market update. If you'd like to find out more about what's happening in freight, go to dat.com forward slash market update and download our weekly freight market report. So that's it for the update. Over to you, Ned, for the forecast. Hi, everybody. Um, so we're dealing with some new production uh, crew today, so the charts might not exactly line up with what we're talking to, but we'll, we'll get through her. And all these charts will be available at our weekly market update, so uh, you won't be missing too, too much. All right, so we're going to be starting off with our dry van forecast. Uh, so the dry van forecast is going to be 
uh, similar to what we've done before. So the blue line will be the historic, the uh, actual market rate observed by DAT. And then off to the right, you'll be seeing what we call the spaghetti plots, which are a couple of our model suites that we're running. In the red, we have our short-term model, which is uh, predicting kind of down and to the right going in through uh, the end of May. Ratecast, our flagship model, is in green and is predicting a slight downward trend with a pickup as we head into the end of May, while our blended forecasts in gold and silver are mixtures of those two models in different amounts in different ways. And they're uh, trending towards the short term initially and then breaking towards the rate cast model, uh, a little more towards the rate cast model as we head into the later part of May. Moving on to the next chart, uh, reefer forecasts. There's a lot of model agreement in our reefer forecasts. Once again, you can see the market rates observed by DAT in the blue line. And then off to the right, our spaghetti. The short-term model in red is expecting things to be mostly flat. The rate cast model is predicting uh, flat with a little bit of an uptick as we head into the later part of May, while our blended forecasts are again kind of straddling that middle space as they do, uh, but with uh, leaning a little bit more towards an uptick, although it's a little bit muted as we head into the later part of May. Uh, finally, we're going to be moving to our flatbed forecast. In flatbed, the short-term forecast has been performing very, very well recently, so I would definitely keep my eye on that because the flatbed market has been hot, hot, hot. Um, the uh, blue line is the market rates observed by DAT. The red line is our short-term model. Our green line is rate cast, which is hoping that things are going to level off a little bit as we head into the May season. And the blended forecasts are um, basically tracking the short-term with a little bit of a correction downwards. And that is it for our forecast this week. And we are going to be handling our uh, IQ question of the week. Um, because we have um, a guest, our IQ question of the week is going to be talking mostly about his work. What is the impact of uh, retail spending on the freight market? Okay, hello everyone. So what I'm going to be talking about today is a new index that my colleague Yem Boyamole and I produce here at Michigan State, where what we're doing is essentially translating Census Bureau data into actual tonnage of freight that's being hauled by trucking companies. And so what this is focusing on is taking those dollar figures we see every month to get a lot of news coverage and translating that over to actual tonnages of freight. And what we can see here is just kind of the overall retail sector excluding motor vehicles and parts and then uh, gasoline shipments. And the reason for that is because those are gonna be you know, highly specialized loads. We can see here in that black line, that is 2020, where we have this surge of demand that takes place in March with the panic buying. And then it drops a little bit in April, but we still have such strong e-commerce demand at this point, as well as customers stocking up. We're still at you know levels that are unusual, except for the holiday season. And then you can see this elevated time period we have all through um, the remainder of 2020. And just as a comparison, using like a two year over year difference um for the most part in 2020 our index had tonnage up about 20 percent on average from where we were in 2018 which is incredible when you think about it however that being said march of 2021 is the highest reading that we have seen outside of any holiday period ever and the thing is, though, is when you start taking a look, though, at what's going on, you can start seeing a change a little bit in consumer behavior. And so this is going to have major implications for retail or for carriers as you're thinking about the freight network moving throughout the year. So if we can take a look now at maybe sort of a comparison between um, general merchandise and grocery stores. Um, so we can see here is this is data for what are called other general merchandise retailers. So this includes your Walmart, your Costco's and your Target's, um, as well as a lot um, other stores in that mix that sell a wide variety of product like a Big Lots. What you can see here is that we have this spike that occurs in 2020 and it keeps moving forward and we still have record sales. But very importantly, we have march of 2021 being exactly as high as we were in march of 2020. however we now know that that product mix is different because if we take a look at this slide we can see for food and beverage stores 
you can see that panic buying period in March of 2020 standing out very clearly as an all-time record. But if you take a look at March of 2021, we're, not, we're down substantially from that. So we can start to see a change in consumer behavior taking place. And this hasn't really showed up in the data yet until March. And what we're seeing is, is that we know consumers are spending. They're taking that record personal income and that record personal savings rate. They're still translating it over to physical goods, but it's now a changing mix of physical goods. And we can start to see the consumer move away from the retail buying of food and beverage products. So as we start thinking about what that means, that means your load volumes at your Kroger's and your King Supers are going to start being heading down a little bit. Um, and returning more towards normal levels throughout the year. However, your freight that may be going into Walmart distribution centers may be same volume, but it's a different mix than what we had before. But now if we take a look then at one sector that's capturing a lot of folks' attention, and that's very much the flatbed market for building materials and supplies, um, building material and supply dealers. This is a market that has just been red hot. And so you can see 2020, we had by far a record year for um, sales in this sector. And this is just sales, brick and mortar sales. This is not including any e-commerce sales. But if we take a look at where we're at in 2021, we're actually start already starting to have a new you know, record year taking place. And the key thing I wanna emphasize is these plots right here, these are showing real retail sales. So this is removing any inflationary effects that we're seeing from lumber being, for example, double the price that it was last year. So this is factoring that out. And so this just provides a sense, you know, building on what um, Dean and Ned and Ken have discussed about how strong that flatbed market is gonna be in the building material sector over the coming months. I have a question. Yeah, I have a question for you. So you say that you're you're factoring out inflation. So so it seems like you're factoring out like per commodity inflation. Is that correct? Yeah. So what we're doing with this is um, to calculate the tonnage data. Is yeah. we take the retail sales data from mm -hmm. the Census Bureau. The Bureau of mm -hmm. Economic Analysis provides price deflators for the retail sectors. So we're factoring mm -hmm. that out. We convert then data to cost of goods sold through mm -hmm. data from the annual retail trade survey from the Census Bureau. And then lastly, we take that real cost of goods sold and we convert it to tonnage using some links we've built over from the commodity flow survey. So there's like five different steps to go in and uh, to get this. Neat, thanks. Um, I guess when you're talking about the the differentiation, not not to monopolize your time here, but the the differentiation. Let me pull up the chart on my end so I can see what the heck I'm talking about. Uh, where you're looking at like the 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 differentiation between the real retail sales, other general merchandise versus food and beverage. Um, do you have an expectation that these levels are going to be sustained, or we're going to be heading back towards more of even in the, the areas that are much less strongly affected, you can clearly see like a break from the, the historical kind of band that things are falling in. So I guess as we move back to normalcy, do you expect that the, they're gonna head back towards the band or do you think that this represents some kind of like a, a longer term dislocation? I think especially for the other, for the firms like Walmart, we're gonna see you know still very strong volume this year, but it's gonna be a different commodity mix. So, you know, mm -hmm. before so much of it was, you know, paper products and food products. Now, given where consumers are at with spending, it's going to be furniture, it's going to be electronics, it's going to be especially clothing. The one mm -hmm. thing that jumped out looking at the real retail sales was how clothing mm -hmm. had such a strong rebound in March of 2021 compared to where it's been at. It has basically been in the doldrums since the pandemic hit. And so I think what we're going to be seeing is just that different mix. You no, know, from a pure tonnage standpoint, given food is a lot lower dollar per tonnage, dollar per ton than clothing, that would be suggesting less truckloads of freight going there because mm -hmm. of just that changing commodity mix right now. Right. So Jason, <clears throat> we've been uh, over the past year. There's just been some like what I would call like differential reporting in terms of like where some of the major indices have been evaluating or at least benchmarking where freight right so 
a lot of the ones that are more holistic have been showing more modest growth. And then there's been kind of a small minority of metrics that have shown like this explosive growth. I think one of the, one of the main um, explanations I've heard out there is some of those other indices are more heavily weighted towards retail. Do you think that like now that you've developed this, do you think that would be a reasonable explanation of why some market sizing metrics would have plus 20 to 40% year over year growth um, because they're predominantly seeing retail? Yeah, I think that that's a good point. And so I think one is the freight mix could certainly be retail focused, but also depending on whether you're seeing data that is, you know, loads that are being handed off to brokers or not. And the reason I say that is we, you know, with the freight markets being thrown into such upheaval last year, you had an increasingly large amount of freight had, having to be handed off to brokerage firms because asset-based providers that were planning on, let's say, 10 loads a week on a lane are now receiving 20. They can't locate enough equipment, so they're going to be denying those tenders. And if you're a shipper, what are you going to do? You're going to have to go to a broker to get capacity. So I think that you could have a combination of if you had some type of index that was very retail centric and it was also receiving a lot of information about shipments that were being handed to brokers, you would expect to see essentially an abnormal inflation. The mm. thing I would always stress is that when we think of, you know, trucking, our productivity has not dramatically changed since the mid 2000s. And so at some point we have to ask ourselves, what is the employment level in the sector? And you can't get output statistics that are dramatically different from where we know employment information is. The caveat I will say is the employment data that we have access to is only employees. It's not independent owner operators. We don't see that information. We actually don't even see contract owner operators because those are independent contractors. And so we always have to take sort of the BLS's employment data with a grain of salt and that it may be missing that. And there's so much discussion of, you know, record operating authority grants. We know that more drivers are breaking off and they're out. But, you know, you look at, CAT, you know, the CAS index, Michigan State publishes um, a couple indices that are overall volume. We've essentially returned to where we were pre-pandemic, but we're not dramatically above that. Right. That's a really good explanation. I think, yeah. you know, if you're if you're serving the auto industry, you're having a much different market experience right now than you would be if you're serving, you know, retail grocery or discount clothing. Right. No, exactly. And, you know, the one thing I'd stress is our ton mileage index, the index that we produce here at Michigan State, where we use the commodity flow survey to say, OK, what industries ship essentially what percentage of ton mileage? You'll see sectors that you don't even think about, but the mining industry, because of quarrying activities, produces roughly 6% of all ton mileage in the United States every year. And so we don't necessarily think of that because that's all short distance, you know, completely contract freight movements. But when we start thinking about, you know, factors that affect the need for truck drivers, if you have hydraulic fracturing, you know, in the doldrums like it still is because of where oil has been at, that's taking out a lot of employment need. And so that's taking out a lot of freight volume from the market. Um, one, I have one other question before, uh, unless Dean has some more before we move to, to user quest, uh, to, to listener questions, but that is, um, you're, you're looking predominantly at retail establishments and there has been a large scale growth in e-commerce over the last like three to four years, but nevertheless, you're still seeing like a pretty big growth in this, this index in terms of the, the retail volumes being shipped. Um, does that imply that there's this dark market that's not being captured in e-commerce that would be pushing this even, you know, effectively higher or, um, yeah, just, just kind of talk to that, I suppose. Yeah. So we, we do capture the e-commerce data and this. Oh, you do? Okay. Non, okay. Yeah. Through the non-store retail sector. So mm. one thing that's very important to recognize is how the Census Bureau collects data on e-commerce sales is very different from what we intuitively think about it. So if Lowe's mm -hmm. or Home Depot is reporting their financials or Walmart or Target, they report the entire basket. And we think of, you know, Lowe's as a building material and supply dealer. But how census data is collected is there's one survey going for all the physical stores that are that Lowe's and Home Depot have. 
There's a second survey that goes for any e-commerce DCs and that data is split. And so that's actually one thing we've observed is that the non-store retail sales that capture e-commerce, the product mix in that looks very different today than what it did in 2019. And that's from some other research projects I'm doing with some colleagues here. And so we are capturing that. We actually had to make some special adjustments on the index to account for the fact that essentially in 2017, e-commerce was primarily medicines was number one. Number two was uh, electronics and number three was clothing. Mm-hmm. That freight mix is now very different when people are buying things online. And so we had to you know, adjust that out. So th- this is capturing that and making an adjustment to say, we think that it's lower dollar per tonnage freight since the pandemic than before. Mm-hmm. The um, other, maybe it's an observation, maybe Jason could comment on it, but we've, we've seen a lot of press about record numbers of trailer orders. So when you think about retail freight, which is sort of more high cube, you know, higher volume freight, uh, a lot of that big warehouse fulfillment e-commerce has required a lot more drop and hook freight as the warehouses have become more congested. So, you know, anecdotally, I talk to carriers and they say they just need more trailers. And of course, in busy times like this, trailers become mobile warehouses in between distribution points. So I think that your charts kind of support the idea that we've had a lot more demand for dry vans than ever before, largely because of this excess volume we've seen in that particular sector. Yeah, no, that makes very good sense. We've actually been working on some research here at um, Michigan State that's been dealing with this issue of essentially are carriers investing in capital equipment differently through the pandemic? And the answer to that is yes, and that we're not seeing the new tractor orders that we would expect given how high spot prices are, but we are seeing the number of new trailer orders that we would expect given how high spot prices are. And Dan, I think it kind of fits to that, that it's carriers saying, look, I don't know if, you know, one, I don't know what demand is going to look like a year from now, because there's just so much uncertainty about how the consumer's behavior is going to change, how is manufacturing going to recover. But then there's also this dynamic of, I don't know if I can see drivers taking place. Right. Right. But, you know, I don't want to pay $150,000 for a new truck if I ne- don't have drivers for it, but I can always add to my trail account and I can actually sell that as better service. So I think right. that the dynamic you're pointed out makes perfect sense. Yeah. 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 There's no microchips in trailers either. Well, <laughs> dry van, dry trailers, dry trailers anyway. I'm sure there's controllers for the reefer units. Right. Uh, Ned, we have a couple questions. And if you have any more, we'll try to squeeze them in here in the last few minutes. Yeah. So uh, drop them below. But I know that we at least have a few stacked up there, Ned, if you want to read those Absolutely. off. Absolutely. Uh, from Fresh Air Brown, when fuel prices are going up, should contract rates go up or is it just spot market load price up? Uh, who wants to field that? So uh, there's two ways to answer that question. The first is we report everything during this show and for our analysis, excluding fuel. So it would have no effect, I guess. Um, the secondary point to make is a little bit more of a complex answer in that um, Fuel tends to have a relatively inverse effect on prices, at least that we've observed, um, in the sense that the shipper is receiving, right, the shipper is paying the total price, right, the the, the line haul plus fuel. So what we've seen is when fuel prices go up, that can actually be relatively deflationary on line haul because it's harder to pass along higher base prices and higher fuel prices. And as um, fuel prices are falling, we've actually seen prices less responsive um, to downward market pressures because they're offering shippers savings in the form of fuel. So the short answer is directly, no. Indirectly, there's potentially some correlation, some inverse correlation there um, when you look at, at fuel prices. But spot and contract, by and large, are largely subject to fuel surcharge. There's some brokered moves where you might not see it split out, but it's still in there, right? They're still compensating for fuel somehow. So hopefully that, any, unless someone else has something to add. I, I mean, in terms of rates, uh, again, contract rates are always slower to respond than spot rates are, and they, there's an attempt to compensate to rising prices with fuel surcharges, but, you know, it's not going to be perfect. And so you would expect any kind of a, a shock on the market to affect spot first and then contract later, unless you're talking about like new, newly originated contracts as opposed to older contracts. Right. 
very rarely will you see a contract with a fixed fuel program and they almost they almost universally have fuel surcharges unless it's dedicated and they want like an all-in route price and even then usually there's some fuel surcharge program that moves with the eia price of diesel by pad uh kevin asks i th- believe i heard dean say that van and reefer rates both fell last week for the- but the dat trends lines charts indicate that rates were up 0.6 and 0.7 percent respectively can you explain the answer unfortunately involves math that i don't want to do live on the show but trend lines is essentially calculated as a basket of lanes and information uh that is different than the charts that we show on the show. The charts that we show on sh- the show are essentially just looking at raw national rates, right. and that's it. Trend Lines has a little bit more. If you want to email askiq at dat.com, I will round up the exact math, and I can I can show you exactly what's going into Trend Lines, or, or insofar as I am allowed to by the marketing department, I will show you... <laughs> <laughs> the I mean, for all intents and purposes, it was flat. Whether it was uh, down yeah. a half a percent or up a half a percent on a national basis on hundreds of millions of dollars of freight transactions, it was effectively flat. Mm-hmm. Right? So that's really kind of, I think, the takeaway is that I, the, between the two calculation, <laughs> calculation methodologies, there's a plus or minus 1% wiggle depending on how you calculate it. CR asks, what does the industry look like for dispatchers? Hmm. I would get on a good blood pressure medicine. <laughs> do the balance of the year. I think that's that's, I think that's my advice. It's also time to be extra nice to drivers because uh, pay rises are going to be, you know, attractive for driver churn. Um, but it's also a time to invest in drivers, and uh, you know, drivers are going to be hard to come by. You've got to invest more time in looking after them. Uh, spend more time communicating with them, carve out some time for those drivers that need a little bit more love and attention. Uh, that would be my best advice because there's uh, going to be a lot of pressure to keep drivers and keep them busy um, in coming months. Especially with all the new equipment that's uh, projected to be coming online. Mm-hmm. When it comes online. When it comes yeah. online, yes. Yeah. So, hey, I'm going to kind of bogart this last question because we have Jason and just ask, put him on the spot and ask him what his outlook is for the balance of 2021. Oh, you had, you had to ask that one, didn't you? Uh, <laughs> oh, I did. Because, <laughs> uh, man, my crystal ball was so broken last year. So t- take this with a grain of salt. But um, I think right now, you know, there was the, – the situation was pre-polar vortex, post-polar vortex. If you would have asked this in early February, I would have said, you know, this seems like the spot market's cooling. Contract prices have been heading up. We're going to see tender rejections getting under control. And then the consumer's share wallet's going to start changing. And then after July 4th, for sure, the spot market's going to cool down. Then you have the vortex. That's an assessment I would have wholeheartedly agreed with, by the way. Yeah. Now, you know, the vortex completely reset the spot market. I mean, we saw March had record high prices. I mean, April's essentially stayed at record high prices. And and we're heading into, you know, June is always the peak month for, you know, dry van and refrigerated uh, spot prices. So I think that, you know, spot's going to stay very hot through July 4th. There's just no way that comes down. After July 4th, assuming that we slowly but surely have, you know, you know, where you can start returning to normal, consumers share wallets start shifting back over a little bit away from physical goods. And assuming that we still have enough supply chain snags to keep manufacturing activity from fully rebounding, I think you're going to start to see that market ease, um, you know, heading into, you know, fall retail peak season. The ca- So to me, the biggest thing I'm watching for is what starts happening on the manufacturing side, because um, that is going to be the key. I mean, that is still the biggest driver of overall ton mileage is by far manufacturing. So that that's one misconception that exists is that, you know, we don't manufacture anything. We manufacture a tremendous amount here. And that's still the biggest driver of freight. The other concern to watch for is inflation of commodities. You know, steel's up 40 percent um, based on the Bureau of Labor Statistics data from before COVID hit. Um, lumber's double, softwood lumber's double. And so I do start to wonder if we're going to start seeing some deferred, you know, investment and deferred construction with folks saying, you know, I don't want to put on a new back deck when lumber is double the price. And we start seeing that pushed out. So I think that to me, the two things to watch for are 
where's manufacturing activity at because of all the snags in the supply chain? And then where's inflation at on commodities? And does that essentially mute some of the manufacturing recovery? Can I just ask one tiny little follow-up? I know that we're running slightly over time, but um, depending on the way that the hurricane season, um, you, you were talking about like the way that the snags uh, can have an impact. But I, I guess my question is, depending on how strong the hurricane season is and whether we have really bad storms like we've had in the last couple of years, with rates as high as they are, is there a lot of headroom to kind of compensate with that? I don't know. I, I think rates are honestly getting a little bit tapped out right now. I just don't feasibly see how it's going to get that 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 much yeah. higher, especially because we are going to see that increasing pay for drivers will draw more people into the industry as we start seeing the driver training schools getting back closer and closer to full capacity. I mean, there, there's too much evidence from Bureau of Labor Statistics that, you know, Trucking is just like any other labor market. Wages go up, people start going into it. So once we get this supply constraint removed, wages keep going up, that's going to pull pull your supply back in. So we had a spicy question come in from none other than Donald Broughton at the last minute. Um, I'll do my best to read it. And then Jason, if you don't mind addressing it, that would be awesome because I think it's a good question. So. Donald's talking about uh, some of Jason's comments around the mining industry and basically saying it's true that segments such as mining uh, generate a materially significant number of ton miles, but it's not a huge factor because a lot of those fleets are private and they don't solicit for backhauls. Um, even if they uh, they were for higher trucks in the mining industry, um, cost of transportation so large, there would be no pricing power. Um, and he asserts that inflation in lumber and steel are temporal. Thoughts, Jason? Sure. So I guess so what I meant by the uh, comment about, you know, factoring in that sector is if you have an index and you're measuring overall trucking activity in the United States, you have you have to factor in what is going on in those sectors to figure out overall ton mileage. And you also have to consider when the Bureau of Labor Statistics is reporting overall truck transportation employment data, it is including all of those drivers who are working, you know, at, at establishments that are classified as for hire trucking, regardless of what type of freight they're hauling. So my co point with that comment is just, if you think about overall freight activity, you have to include that sector. It doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be affecting, you know, and cascading over to the other sectors. On the inflationary front, um, especially with steel, the concern I have is prices are going up, but we're not seeing the steel mills refire any furnaces that were shut down. So the industrial production for steel is still dramatically lower than what it was before COVID started. And so my concern there, and the same way with sawmills, a lot of Canadian sawmills shut down in 2019 when lumber prices were low. And we our sawmill capacity is still well, well, well below where we were before um, the Great Recession had. And so the it may be temporary, but I don't see those prices coming down that that dramatically throughout the year because we just don't have the overall industrial capacity to increase output that much. Plus, these are concentrated sectors. And if I'm a producer, why am I going to fire up more capacity if I'm making more money? Yeah, you know, the one thing I heard it was an interesting and I have not had time to dig into it is there's been a shortage in ways for large corporations to spend money that they can write off. So carbon offsets has been a huge you know, investment area. And one of the main ways that uh, company, you know, that they make these carbon offsets available is to protect forestry land or land that could be used for timber. So it's actually limiting the supply of lumber far upstream from even the sawmills. Um, and again, that's kind of feedback I've heard talking to folks. I haven't really had a chance to dig into that too much myself. All right. We're getting the shepherd's cook from uh, our new production staff. So I think it's it's time to wrap. Uh, any shout outs that we need to do before we close? No. Uh, Freight Find Podcast. I highly recommend checking that out. Um, uh, Jason, where can folks find your work other than kind of your LinkedIn posts if they're really interested in rolling up their sleeves and digging in? Yeah, I would say uh, the work that is public consumption, LinkedIn, you, you don't really want to read the academic research I do. It's, uh, <laughs> it's written in a very different language, for lack of a better term, a lot of Greek. <laughs> All right. Uh, Dean's Market Update, um, uh, you can check out on our website. 
Um, and with that, we'll be back next week um, to talk about all the fun stuff that's happened over the next seven days. So with that, we're going to sign off, and we hope to see you next week. Thanks, everyone. Happy Road Check Week, Mother's Day, and Cinco de Mayo next week for everybody. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye.